Yes. Miss Taylor, your client is not here. Is that right? My lord, she is on her way, uh, but I didn't want to hold up your lordships, uh, given the... Uh, <laughs> and lordships and her ladyship, I apologise, given that we really will be having quite dense legal discussions, yes. which I hope she can follow. I was hoping to see her before we started. Yes. and to explain things. We have an interpreter here. Yes. So we were um, minded to suggest that we continue with uh, permission for her to come in and join. Yes. Uh, you met her, obviously, you acted before, before, so you, you know... Oh, yes, know her very, so well very well indeed. Um, All right. you, don't need to, you don't need to speak to her before we start. No, no. Thank you. No, no. We're well instructed. Thank you. All right. Well, we will proceed on that basis. Right, so this is, um, just to remind everybody, we're being live-streamed at this hearing. So can we do our best, please, not to mention the children or any of the family? I mention that because it's very difficult uh, to avoid doing that. It happens in nearly every case that that is overlooked, but please can we do our best? That's the first point. The second point is, um, can I just mention the question of intermediaries? I think two of the parties uh, applied to the court for an intermediary. That would have been uh, a, uh, you, your club solicitors, Miss Weston, and the official solicitor. I think the official solicitor uh, applied on behalf of the father. Um, the the practice in this court is not to order intermediaries, um, and we weren't persuaded that the circumstances were sufficiently exceptional in this case to justify it. Um, I, I'll do, I propose to deal with that a little bit more in, in, the, in the judgment. Is there anything you wanted to say about that issue now, Ms. Weston? My Lord, no. I mean, basically, this, the nature of the appeal hearing makes it less necessary for the inter there to be an intermediary provision, and in the context where intermediaries are in such high demand at the moment, My Lord. Uh, that's the general policy in this court. My Lord, um, I take that observation. Um, I would only add one other thing on uh, anonymity, and that is that um, I'm sure um, Mother knows this already, but my client has taken a seat out of shot, um, and um, I would just suggest, as I hadn't done previously, that Mother does also. Thank you. Right. Okay. So just thinking about how we're going to do that, that would mean that she would be at the back of the court where your client is now sitting. My Lord, yes, I understand. It's having um, arisen in a previous case, but that is the place to sit if you want to. Want yes, to the cameras will catch the council's row and possibly all the rows that are uh, the two rows behind the uh, leading council's row, um, but not the back of the Certainly on that side of the back. Yes, thank you very much. Right, well, could that be sorted when she arrives, please? That's Miss Bagchuk who saw that. Yes. Right, now, um, turning to the appeal, we're very grateful to all of you for all the hard work you've put in, and to those who sit behind you getting this appeal ready uh, for urgent hearing. We've all had a chance to read the papers very carefully and to consider the grounds of appeal. Um, Ms. Weston, it, it, it's our view, something that you may say, that grounds one and five are, uh, are the principal grounds that arise for consideration here. Those are the grounds which are, are, in, are at the forefront of our minds. Um, and the second issue which is in the forefront of our minds is this. In the event that we were to allow the appeals, what happens then? We're very conscious that um, M is about to be 17. So consequently, if there is to be a care order in respect of her, it would have to be before her 17th birthday, if I've got the law right, Miss Weston, Miss Taylor's nodding. So in those circumstances, it really does mean that uh, it's a, a, the greatest urgency that if the appeal were to be allowed, that the proceedings are dealt with as quickly as possible. And the other question in our mind is whether 
is if we allow the appeal, whether or not a complete rehearing or any rehearing is required. We note what the parties have said about that in their skeleton markets. So that's what's really featuring in our mind. Is that helpful, Ms. It's, it's, it's most Ms. helpful. Weston? Um, I'd, I'd make uh, one observation, obviously, as the intervener. Yes. We haven't been involved after the 21st of March, and so I'm unable to assist the court with the latest on the position with care plans. Yes. But on the last point first, if the appeal is allowed, my client's position is that he would abide by whatever contact arrangements the court thought appropriate, bearing in mind the best interests of, in, of in particular, M and L, and any uh, mental condition which might be affecting that question, because he recognises that um, both his sisters are in um, have, have suffered and are suffering and it may be that a court looking at the way forward for this family was of the view that there should be um, voluntary or ordered restrictions on contact going forward he accepts that well that's very helpful Ms Weston thank you very much that's obviously on the basis of no admissions whatsoever. Yes. Thank you. Well, you've set out what you... Turning to the grounds one and... What I'd li we'd like to do is to hear the parties on grounds one and five initially. Yes. They do really... The, the appeal divides into two categories. Two, the grounds into two. There's grounds one and five, which seem to us to be very much linked. And then different points on two, three. I yes. think we'd like to hear the parties on grounds yes. one and five. I, I, I would simply say as a gloss that all may, although it may not be necessary to descend to that degree of particularity given the way that ground one, uh, grounds one and five are framed, ground three does identify what we say is some very serious factual errors and omissions. Yes. Obviously, if the court is persuaded of, with, of, on ground one and five, then there's no need for me to descend to that particularity. No, but the, the, the omissions point is very central to your ground one. Yours and Ms. Taylor's ground one. Um, I'm, I'm grateful. It was just that that's how we'd structured it in the, yes. in the appeal. Now, you've, 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 um, you've set out your arguments on ground one, if I may say so, uh, it, it, very clearly in your skeleton argument. What would you wish to add to that? Um, what, what I had not done, I'm, I'm mindful of, um, if I could just turn up what the President said in Re B at paragraph 21, President about, I think it's parties needing to know why their submissions failed and others succeeded. Yes. Page 44 of the authority. Thank you. Oh, most great One point. of you makes that point in the... Either you or Ms. Taylor makes that point in your, in your skeleton. So, identified as an error here. This is which we read? This, no, this is adequacy of reason. That's right. Right. Sorry, yes, it's two rebees. I didn't identify right. it. Um, there's effectively no account by the judge of the parents' evidence or of the general case put forward on their behalf. This is, in my view, a significant, significant omission. A parent in proceedings of this nature, and we say most obviously an intervener, should expect to see from the judgment that their case has been heard and the judge's reasons for discounting it, if that's the position. Yeah. And so, further to the detail that we were able to put in the limited space of the skeleton argument, I would ask the court to have a look at what that case was on the part of the intervener. And the first place at which that arises is uh, in the submissions. Yes. Well, taking it very briefly, and I'm sure I'm doing an injustice to what you're about to say, the sense from the judgment is that the judge considered your case to be a fair denial. 
whereas in fact your client's case was much more nuanced than that. It well, was uh, name, not me, I mean that is putting it even more crudely, but it, it accepted that there may have been uh, acts of abuse perpetrated on M, but denied that he was responsible. Yes, and, and what he also did, although he's not required to, was that he explained in some detail with some corroboration how and over what time period their relationship had deteriorated. Yes. He talked about the, that's right, the deterioration in their relationship. That's right, yes. culminating in him calling the police on the 5th of yeah. February. Yeah, that's right. And then the allegations being made yes. to the police. Well, you do make, I think you do make that point in your skeleton argument. So now I pick it up. Forgive me. I, I, but you say, is there a document you wanted to show us which uh, s s set out the points that you say elaborated your client's case, but weren't yes. referred to the in, By reference to all the supporting evidence. Yeah. And one finds that in the core bundle of 386. I hope is your electronic number the same as our number? Oh, that I don't know. No. Uh, 486. 386. 386. I, I have a nasty feeling the electronic number is not going to be the same. It almost always is different. Um, right. Sorry, that's my right. call. I, I think I think the mother has now arrived, Miss Bagchew. Yes. Can I can I ask uh, the, the mother and her interpreter to go into the back row, please? I'm, I'm, I'm. Do I need to explain why, Miss Bagchew? Do you want to? No, I'm, the interpreter was aware of this before. Okay. I think further along the back row would be best. Thank you very much. <coughs> That's fine. Thank you. My Lord raised the question of whether the um, electronic bundle numbering is the same. It, it almost never is, because everyone always I, forgets um, that there's my, an index. My, my Lord Virginia tells me it says it's 417 or 427. I think we're going to have to have the, the electronic numbering every time, please. Yeah. Because, oh, because the page has got shifted. Also, some of the, we've got 87A, 87J, yes. et cetera. Which, 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 which um, paper page do you want? 386. 386. Of the call It's uh, 388. And then the call But anyway, I'll be able to find them. Heartfelt apologies. <laughs> okay. What, so where exactly in this document do you want us to go? So um, what, what, this, what, what this document did um, was um, effectively set out by reference to the supporting evidence yeah. how the relationship had deteriorated. Um, and also the lengthy history of the case. So you'll recall that the judge says in his judgment, I start in, I, I need to start in 2017. But what these submissions have done, and we see it from the bottom of my page, um, 387. Internal? Um, yeah. Two? 428. 428. It's little Roman numeral 7. Yeah, there is Cooper's evidence. So what, what, the, what the background evidence did was go back to at least 2013. Yes. Um, and the family had been known to social services yes. and a subject of concern for many, a number of years. Yes, under the category of emotional neglect. Mm. And, and I, I, I referenced without turning up at that point, of course, what Dr. Muhammad had said when examining the, the children about the impact that that long-standing issue of emotional neglect had had on M's development. You mentioned Dr. Muhammad. Am I right that Dr. Muhammad's report is not mentioned at all in the judgment? Yes. Thank you. Um, I don't add to what I say in the skeleton about Dr. Muhammad's report. I make yeah. a number of points about it. Um, uh, and, and then on page uh, three, uh, uh, on, under my, my um, heading C, Review of matters having a bearing on the weight to be attached to MR's allegations. Oh. I set out in some detail the history of the contact with social services. Well, although the judge says he had read the submissions, and I'm quite sure he did, he doesn't refer to them at all. Well, he, 
doesn't mention, no, that's right. Um, he certainly doesn't um, identify what the, the, key, the key points that the submissions were, be, were making, and he doesn't identify any reasons why he rejected them, if he rejected them, which yeah. one presumes he must have. Um, yes. One of the points made in the skeleton argument is about the lack of findings in respect of the numerous witnesses who gave oral evidence. And another reason why I turn up the um, uh, submissions is because at page 390, I turn my back, it's uh, the, the heading uh, 431. 431. 431. I won't say the name, C.N. Yes, that's she, the safeguarding lead at the school. That's right. And what, what that um, uh, uh, witness gave ev evidence about was her impressions of the relationship between the siblings at the material time. Yes, and that's not mentioned. No. That, that evidence is not mentioned. I think there is a reference to C.N. But there is, but but only in passing. That's right. And, th and that was key, of course, because what the judge didn't have was a witness statement in advance setting out the investigation that had been carried out by the local authority in respect to those matters. He hadn't had, he had a statement from this witness? Yes, but the, the statement just said, uh, I've seen these documents and I accept it. It was a standard sort of template type statement, accepting okay. the, um, uh, um, deposing as to the, to the documents being um, submitted. Um, what there wasn't was any um, investigation? This all this all this information came out during the hearing, and it it wasn't information obviously that um, YR was in a position to know in advance. But it was information which 100% corroborated his account. And we say for those reasons it was particularly material that the judge had regard to and dealt with those aspects of the submission. Um, a number of quite um, dense points are made in those submissions and, and we say that they um, uh, were all relevant and they were all, uh, some more than others I accept, but the underlying issue is that there was quite a comprehensive analysis in those submissions of the extent to which the evidence available to the court corroborated or was consistent with YR's uh, analysis. And undermined MR's. Indeed. And therefore had to be dealt with, had to be evaluated and uh, good reasons given for preferring one narrative over another. So I didn't have anything to add on the submissions, but I would like to turn up, if I may, the evidence that um, uh, YR had, had submitted, in, by the way, of a statement and uh, evidence and photograph. And we find that in the supplementary appeal bundle. my page A9 um, now in my respectful submission on, on no rational basis could it be said that there, this very detailed account amounted to a bare denial or a bare assertion of, of lies what it did was document um, the history of the deterioration of his account of the deterioration in family relationships and included quite detailed accounts of being asked by M, well, sorry, by his mother to go and fetch back M when she was out at times when M considered her mother considered she should not be out. Mm -hmm. 
Um, um, he, in the next statement, which begins at A15, he gives a detailed account of uh, the circumstances in which um, uh, photographs on his telephone had been transferred to uh, Laura's telephone and explained that the photo alleged to be of M was in fact a photo of an unknown female um, which along with large numbers of other photos had been automatically downloaded from his friend's uh, WhatsApp group. So he had an account for his photograph yes. on the photographs issue, which, yes. and your point is, what's, was it considered in the judgment? Yeah, not considered at all. Um, uh, and again, that that statement, in addition, at A twenty, <coughs> provided a very thoughtful account of um, his experience of Marianne, sorry, M's behaviour, behaviour, M's behaviour, and um, uh, we say that um, this was a sympathetic and um, nuanced account which the judge failed to Um, attached at um, uh, A33, the court can see one of the photographs that, uh, that, that accompanied that yes. statement and the uh, this photograph um, was advanced as being a photograph taken by um, YR on one of the occasions when he'd been sent to secure the return of M at A33. There were other photographs of less or more probative weight, but what they did do in my respectful submission was support um, Wise account of drugs having been found in the home. You see those pictures at A47 and A49. The um, uh, uh, alleged spice vapes, which were found at A38. These are all referred to in his statement. Mm -hmm. And in my respect for submission, these were all matters that the court had to take into account before rejecting the family's account that um, associations with outside influences and um, drugs had formed part of the matrix leading to the allegations. Um, it, it, in my submission, the judge wholly um, misrepresented and or misapprehended the case being made on behalf of YR when he suggested that somehow there was a direct causative relationship between what the drug, what, what the gang was doing, and what had been alleged. In fact, the picture was much more complex. And then in uh, the third statement, again, um, um, why I said some very insightful things, um, I submit. Um, Sorry, which page again? Uh, we're at A51, and in particular, mm. at the bottom of paragraph 3 on A52, Um, 
And paragraph like, seven. <clears throat> it was actually paragraph three I was um, okay. uh, highlighting when he says, I feel horribly conflicted because I love my sister, but I know her very well. She's very good at getting what she thinks she wants and she doesn't care who she hurts in the process. Herself, my parents, my small brother, my sister and me. And that is a not particularly sympathetic um, uh, analysis, but it's from the perspective of a, of a teenage boy. Um, paragraph 7 says more about what his experience of social services has been. Yes. Um, so, so, so we say, um, in fact, there, was, there was, was in fact just one additional um, uh, statement at A87. A and that just deals with um, allegations that About the um, he's second. been at the house. Yes. Um, so, so we say, in addition to that, there was a large amount of oral cross-examination. I just wanted to say a couple of words about that, because this young person had uh, some communication difficulties which were picked up at an early enough stage to get him some support. Mm. In common with the rest of his siblings, they haven't come out of the blue, that's something that all the siblings have suffered with. But like a lot of um, uh, overwhelmed young people, he had something of the rabbit in the headlights about him giving evidence. And it was very hard for him. And he st stayed the course, and he stayed polite, and he stayed engaged, and he did his absolute best to answer all the questions. How long was he giving evidence? It was at least a couple of hours. May I just turn my back? All, all told. I know that um, it, it would have been because the... The, the, gar the Guardian had about 40 minutes, and all told, I think it was about. Sorry? Almost a day. Was it? Breaks. Almost a yes. day. Yeah. It was yeah. this. Yeah. Forgive me. It was almost a day with breaks. Um, Thank you. One sees nothing of And he had an intermediary. Yes, he did. Um, I'm grateful to my learned friends for clarifying that. Um, uh, it, we, one sees no trace of that in the judge's judgment. Well, is the only thing the judge says at paragraph 22, where, oh, 20, where oh, he's... Suffering mental health at yes, that point, that's it. that's yes. it, yeah. I'm like, all the bundles open, just remind me, paragraph 20. Yeah. And the court, and the judge. There, was, there was just one more piece one of evidence seven. that I wanted to go to, if I may. Yeah. Yes, Miss Oberson? Um, and that's at the back of the, um, near the back of the supplementary bundle. Um, and um, it's um, an email at G367, my G367. Um, from um, uh, P House. I don't know if the court has it. It says allegation M made against member of staff. Yep. Yes. And this is um, to the um, social worker. Yes. Um, it it was a feature of of YR's submissions that another a key plank of um, the evidence concerning or, or of direct relevance to the weight that could be attached to the allegations was that. False allegations had been made mm. by M on numerous occasions. Now, um, it was YR's case that those allegations didn't come out of the blue, but were normally a response to having wishes thwarted or um, deflecting responsibility for behaviours. And that evidence formed part of the oral evidence of the workers from Pelham House, and that was quite a lot of um, 
uh, oral evidence about that and cross-examination about that. Um, and uh, I think it's fair to say that not everybody agreed. Um, that the evidence wasn't all one way. Um, but it was important, we say, that those staff at, at P House had identified, if one just reads through the bottom paragraph of, of F1, sorry, of um, D367, the, the beginning I am currently investigating. Yes. Should we just read that? Yes, please. This is a low-level allegation. Yes, so this is um, what, what's, being dis what's being discussed there. This is only one part of the evidence, but it, this is, is an apparent pattern of behaviour regarding allegations. Regarding low-level yes. allegations, so not presumably sexual allegations. <coughs> that would um, be described as low-level. My understanding that they include inappropriate touching, but right. yes. Right. Um, there were other allegations that involved okay. sexual allegations. That's right. There was an allegation in criminal proceedings. I don't know if the courts picked pick that up, which were, um, uh, I, I think it's like to say that um, uh, the sexual, uh, sexual touching was rejected by the jury and on the other one kissing, alleged kissing, that there was no finding. Yeah, that's in the sentencing remarks, which I think is quite bad. So, in, in essence, <laughs> there was an issue around uh, false allegations, and the issue raised and sort of fleshed out in some more detail by the um, intervener in uh, his written submissions and in his reply submissions. Um, uh, was that this is something that would have a material bearing, bearing in mind, of course, the forensic problems in a case of this kind as identified by um, Mr Justice MacDonald in the P case. I know the court's familiar with it. I wasn't going to go to it, but I was just going to flag up that the court doesn't, although the court um, refers itself to some aspects of the forensic difficulty, doesn't deal with the issues that arise um, as needing attention, careful attention um, in the in the repeat. Um, there, and then there was um, the, the court will be aware that after the um, main hearing in this case, of the, when the evidence was heard, there were then alleged yes further allegations of further, further one allegations. of the other children. Yes, and the, the court has got detail in the skeleton argument about those. Um, Further submissions were put in, which the court has, by YI, explaining why that corroborated his account. Um, and a uh, judge doesn't mention them. Um, I've made those submissions in short form because the court has the, the, yes, the, the you details. Yes, have, and that's what we asked you to do. So Indeed, okay. I'm grateful. So I'm just going to turn my back for a moment, if I may. Um, that, that, I, I, that's what you'd want to add on ground one. On ground one. Ground five, really, is there much more to say? You've made, you've asserted it's not the way the judge, the judge did it in the way that you shouldn't have done it. That's your case. Just, just that uh, I don't know if the court is going to say anything about <laughs> the appropriate of that course. However... I, I do have just enough experience to know what works well. And what works well in a case of this length and complexity is for the parties to make written submissions, the judge to read them, and making the best use of the, the court time, this for half a day so that the judge can raise issues and other people can deal with any matters arising in reply. You mean, way, sorry, um, forgive me. Are you talking about after judgment? No, 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 no my lord, no. I misunderstood uh, you, forgive me. Um, uh, when there are, um, when it comes to the point of submissions. Oh, I see. Yes, there were no, there was no, there were, it was just all written submissions in yes. this case. There was no opportunity for all submissions. No, and, and it was requested. Mm, 
Right, so there was a request, was there? Yes. From one party or all party? Well, I requested it. Nobody disagreed with me, and the court just uh, poo pooed it as not a possibility going to court. Um, this just, it just dealing with it in passing rather than making yes, a rule? Yes, I, I didn't remake a formal application. Perhaps I should have done in hindsight. Yes. I mean, it's always dangerous, Miss Weston, for judges, particularly judges that are long in the tooth, to go back to the way it was when they were practicing. Um, but, of course, in addition to practicing in the family division, I also sat in the family division. And I don't remember a case of, of uh, I'm struggling to remember any case in which I've ever been involved, that first instance, in which there wasn't an opportunity for all of Certainly, in a case of this complexity, I'm absolutely, well, you'll probably find someone on Twitter will correct me, but I, I don't remember ever hearing a case in which I didn't have all submissions to supplement with the submissions. Well, I, I, I would certainly advance that as being a better practice in a case of this complexity. Um, and obviously, to the extent that listing practices may interfere with that then uh, and that's beyond my ken and <laughs> I don't know uh, the, the mechanics of that all, all, all I do know is that all parties in this case um, including to our perception the judge were desperately scratching around for enough time court time to do what needed to be done in this case well of course we are all aware of the pressures in the, in the family court not confined to the family court, by the way. There are pressures in tribunals, for example. Um, they are very great in the family court. They're very great, particularly in London, and lots of other places too, but London in particular. Justice does need to be done. Quite, quite so. And we are obviously dealing with matters of the utmost gravity. Um, yes. Um, unless I can assist the court further. Well, can I just ask you a bit about about? Um, what happens um, if, we're, if we allow the appeal? You, your point is that because you're slightly off the pace, because you're not involved, you, you, you know where we are with the other children, and it might be better to hear from the others, and then you can comment on that if you want to afterwards. My Lord, I, I would suggest that's, that okay. would be the right way forward. Anything else? Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Weston. Thank you both, both of you for your helpful reconsideration. Ms. Taylor, on the, again, I'd like to focus, please, on grounds one and five, and what we do if we allow the appeal on those grounds. My Lords, my Lady, I have um, noted that uh, you have carefully read our skeleton argument yes. and the written submissions prepared on behalf of Mother. Um, I think we've also referred to the skeleton we prepared for permission to appeal, yeah. which you may have seen. Yes. Um, I don't intend to descend into the detail about what is missing, because we could be here all day, and I don't mean that flippantly. There is so much to develop that we touched on in our very, very extensive written submissions. I think ours are about 25 pages yes. long, others at least 30 pages long, and compared to this judgment, which is 10 pages long a mere scanty 76 short paragraph, which scarcely touches on the, doesn't even name the children, doesn't set out the findings that are to be sought, doesn't, doesn't name the witnesses, I mean, we could it go on and on. It says he felt she was making it up. Yes. Well, we could, um, uh, my focus, in fact, in the, what I hope to say in supplement to what I've said in, uh, very clearly in our skeleton, is to, uh, really uh, indicate that we don't 
Uh, ju just to clarify that we say that this is a procedural irregularity because of the uh, gross uh, deficiencies and inadequacies of this judgment. This cannot in any uh, way constitute a fair process for the parties, particularly for the children and the alleged victim. So this, uh, our skeletons and our argument focuses more on procedural fairness and what a judgment should at its very minimum contain and what this is missing, rather than the merits of any decision that the judge may have found on the evidence available to him. Because, um, my lords, my lady, you have his judgment. I can't see that if you were sitting reading his judgment that you could discern what uh, my client's case was, what her evidence was. I have no idea what she said in the witness box, apart from, I think, fleeting impressions given by the judge. And the importance of the procedural regularity of a properly constituted judgment, as uh, explained uh, in by uh, Mr. Justice Peter Jackson in the B, We've all replicated. I think he was Lord Justice by then. Lord Justice, I apologise. <laughs> uh, and of course, um, helpfully repeated uh, my law by yourself in the C D E C D E part case, which uh, sets out everything we need to know about yeah. the law. I won't repeat it. The point is that anyone reading it needs to understand what the issues were, what the arguments were, what people said, and, and why the decision was made. We well, can't it's, identify it's the by critical it. stages of evaluation Absolutely. and analysis that might be thought to be missing. My lady, I say it goes, it's much more profound than I'm, I'm, I'm right in thinking that the, the, these were not public hearings where anyone could turn up and find out what was being no. said. No. It might be different in, in such a case where anyone had the opportunity to go along and observe what was being given in evidence and what was being said in submissions. It might perhaps be said that the judge need to go into such detail, whereas this is a public judgment, isn't it? My Lord, um, in fact, in, I respectfully... In a sense, it can be, yes. I mean, it can be published, I don't know what it was, anonymised. Um, yes. So that we can see, the Most public can see, yes. what the judge said. Yes. Um, but if he tells the public nothing about the evidence and submissions, they have no way of obtaining that information, as I understand it, other than by making a special application to the court. My Lord, I respectfully slightly disagree yeah. uh, with the point you made in that the purpose of a judgment is that that is the part of the judge's role in actually pulling all of the elements of the case together, including the evidence, the findings, the law, his analysis and evaluation. And it's only in the judgment that you have that <coughs> analysis and evaluation. You won't get it from sitting in court. And it's only the judgment that will be published, not the transcript of the evidence. Well, I agree. I, th I think my, I may not have made my point as clearly yes. as I should have done. Um, a judgment, um, as Lord Justice Peter Jackson helpfully told us, is meant to um, set out what happened. It's a report on what happened and, and all the things that you mentioned. Um, if it's the analysis without any sort of narrative, it's quite difficult to follow. If it's a narrative without any analysis, it's not a judgment. Um, my point was that it's all the more important in a case which is heard effectively behind closed doors that the judge should go beyond just stating his conclusion for some brief reasons. I absolutely agree. And if I could supplement uh, your Lordship's point by reminding uh, this court that, of course, the judgment will be read by the professionals who go on to assess the family, the children, potentially in later life, part of life story, particularly for M. Why was she believed? Why was she disbelieved? Critical that it's done properly. Yes, also we... for the intervener, a young person who uh, may have this held against him when he himself uh, develops his own relationships and has a yes, family. Absolutely. The critical uh, need for um, a properly uh, formulated professional judgment could not be particularly when the charges are so serious. Absolutely. I'm going to trespass slightly between ground one and ground five. Yes. Just, uh, well, they do overlap, don't they? 
They do rather. Um, to just to remind the court and to take you on a, a very whistle-stop tour of what happened with the time estimates and the hearing itself, which uh, we've set out in a legal uh, proceedings chronology. I think it's right at the end of the um, core bundle, um, and I will give you the proper pagination. Uh, 565 onwards, sorry it's sideways, um, just so that the uh, court can see what happened with respect to the hearing date. at the internal pagination is 527, the electronic is 568. Legal chronology for appeal. Yes, that's We've had that re-numbered, actually. I, I think it's 524, I think. Oh. It's, a, it's, a, it's a landscape document. Yes, I apologise for that okay. as well. Okay, no, don't worry. All done in haste. 13th of uh, April 2022. So it's the last document in the core bundle, which you... Yeah, well, we've got something else now. I've got something called a composite bundle, which is, that, that's what's confused me. Yes. I had a core bundle and a composite bundle, um, I am which I think includes the core bundle, but that's yes. something else, but not for supplementary bundles. Well. I'm so sorry. <laughs> anyway, our... I thought I was in the right place. I've got a chronology. Thank you. Well, um, and it's called yes. procedural chronology. Yes. Yes. And you want us to be halfway <laughs> through this, do you? Yes. Which page? Looking at uh, yeah. the entry for the 13th of... Urgent April case management 2022. Yes, urgent case management hearing. So the original time estimate was 13 days. This is a very basic overview. Original time mm. estimate, 13 days, listed on the 19th of April. Mm. We know that that was adjourned. Uh, the time estimate was reduced. This wasn't the first time it was listed. It was listed at the end of the previous year, wasn't it? Yes, it had been. I apologise. Um, on the... Uh, the, uh, we look at on the page before uh, 7th and 9th of December 2021. Yes, that's right. The hearing was originally listed for 13 days. Yes. I apologise, I should have... November 21. Beginning. So 13 20. days was the original time estimate. It got reduced um, through no uh, agency of any of the parties. It was the agency, I think, of the court... Court, uh, it was reduced to 10 days without us uh, knowing about it um, until uh, we were, when we were told that the adjourned date for the fact finding hearing was only going to be 10 days. That was in uh, that set out on the 22nd of April. And then it's reduced to nine days. Then it's further reduced to nine days. And we all, uh, those parties who are present, which I think is most of us, know that as soon as we started on day one, his honour judge Oliver said, I haven't got time to deal with this. And the... Uh, oh, well, it, when, when did you say that? When, when it started in August? You mean? Yes, 22nd of August. So at the start of the hearing, you haven't got time to deal with it. Um, and we, we all knew it was going to, that the 13-day time estimate was a realistic one because of the need for interpretation, intermediaries, complexity of the case. <coughs> history, etc., etc., number of witnesses. How much of that time was taken up by playing the AVE interview? None. Wasn't everyone had seen it before? We'd all seen it before yeah. and invited the judge to see it. And then there was no evidence given by... No evidence given by the, 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 the complainant? That's right. No. We, we, we've had some thoughts about the VW process, but they yes. don't really arise on this appeal. No. Um, I... Um, wasn't instructed until after that. I was only instructed for the uh, August hearing, so I'm not exactly clear about what happened at the REW hearing. The but there was one. Yes, there was. Yes. Sometimes. Did anyone call for cross-examination? Yes. Um, it's my understanding that the interveners called for M to be cross-examined, and the REW hearing was uh, in late 2021. One. And was opposed uh, by the Guardian. I'm, I'm, I mean, there are issues about the VW process in this case, but I don't think they really arise on this appeal. 
Yeah. Well, they're not raised on the appeal, so no. I don't think we should get... Although I think it is relevant that cross-examination was called for. Yeah. It is relevant. Um, it makes it even more, um, perhaps, imperative for uh, the judge yes. who doesn't have the child giving evidence that's my point. To be yeah. very, very careful. Exactly. That's how it's quality quality exactly. Exactly. Yeah. If, 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 if the right evidence isn't being tested in that way, yes. then there may be thought to be an additional onus uh, to scrutinise it from other perspectives. Absolutely, Absolutely. particularly the repeat point and the need to very, very carefully scrutinise the context in which the first allegation comes out, which is the police attendance at the home on the 5th of February 2021, and we deal with this in in detail in our written submissions when we submit that this very suggestible young person had descriptions suggested yes. to her which then got fixed as a narrative. Yes, well that's, enough, that's an additional point. Yes. The flaws yes. in the ABE process, so um, even leaving those to one side, Yes. where, where the witness is not cross-examined, um, however difficult that may be from all sorts of points of view, one can see that uh, additional care might be required. It's, um, I, your Lordship has the case of REP, which uh, so carefully... That is Lord, Mr Justice MacDonald. Yes, Mr Justice MacDonald. The last so long case. It's the long case, isn't it? It's the big... It's, it's the exceptionally Burn, long, mm, yes. The, the Birmingham case. Manchester. Birmingham. Birmingham. Birmingham, I apologise. And we've been given extract. Yes, yes. yes he, published a, he, published a he published a reduced judgment, didn't he? Oh, maybe I've got this wrong. Anyway, in, it's in the... The, the, the judge, in part of his judgment, he deals with this at length. Yes. We've got that. Yep. Yes. Going so you're going through the chronology. This. Yes. And um, so you, there you are at the start of the case. The judge says he hasn't got time to deal with it. And hasn't you got time. And you all know it's going to take 13 days. We battle on. Because, and I have to make a notice, the you knew about the interpreter and intermediary issues. Uh, absolutely. And um, we uh, faced as... Uh, parties in a case of this complexity where there's already been significant delay with a very difficult choice. Uh, faced with a judge who has said he hasn't got time, do we just start and hope to persuade the judge that to find some time later? Or abandon and list uh, in the following year, potentially, which simply wasn't a viable option given the particular stresses on the children in the family, including the interview this case continuing in an unresolved manner because of uh, the struggles that all members are having, particularly the children. The struggles could not have been more profound. They're touched on in the skeleton argument. Yeah. Um, sectioning, self-harm, very, very, very complex and uh, difficult. Judge Oliver was persuaded to start so he did. And you can see that. Uh, so when he said, I haven't got time for this, he was really proposing to adjourn. Was he? So, or, or it wasn't just an next. The, next the difficulty was, it was clear um, that I don't think he'd read into it before we started. I'm sure I'll be corrected if I'm wrong. We uh, invited him to start and to find time later. And we were fairly insistent because um, that was the best way for Right, but that meant you, you, pretty, you were pretty clear you weren't going to have time for submissions. No, we weren't going to have time for submissions. Written submissions were always going to be more appropriate yes. because of the complexities and pulling all of the evidence together, yeah. particularly the matters actually not necessarily even tested, but we were referring to in the evidence the uh, social work recordings and other matters. Um, we also invited the judge to view body worn video to check evidence again. Um, that's why it was important to have a pause between the completion of the uh, oral evidence and uh, judgment. Sometimes in these cases, of course, when you start, the number of witnesses fall, a number of witnesses fall away and the issues clarify. Yes. Or become clearer, narrow. But that, did, that probably was never going to happen in this it case. It was never going to happen. Yes. The, right. the um, point about uh, raised by my learned friend for the first appellant uh, intervener about the 
absence of an opportunity for oral submissions, I don't offend the decision about that, but I do remind the court that we were all given the opportunity to file submissions in response, and that's often uh, the that's a pragmatic alternative to um, speaking to submissions. Is that becoming more common? Is that yes. becoming more oh, common? Absolutely. It can take more time and effort to do that than to get up on your feet and actually say yes. things, mm -hmm. uh, as everyone knows. Inf yes. Uh, and, and, and more expense, and yes. generally, it's not a, yes. often not a particularly efficient way of doing yes. things. And then someone says, Well, I want to rejoin her. And, yes. It also means that the judge can't ask a question and have that question answered in the course of that apply. As we've been doing already <laughs> all morning. I hope not too much. <laughs> but um, I mean, it's a, it's a, it is a suboptimal way of proceeding in our in, in the way we work. I mean, if you went to Strasbourg or wherever, where the opportunities of written submissions are very, they're not really submissions at all. They're reading out a speech, but. But um, in our culture, the dynamic of written oral submissions is a crucial part. Even if they're time limited. I we very carefully limit them to 20 minutes each or 30 minutes each. Time as limited reply submissions. sufficient. Absolutely. Very good idea. Provided the judge doesn't intervene too much. <laughs> and even if the judge does, I, I, in my experience, in a wholly different environment, that was generally ample time to respond to the critical points made against you and answer the judge's points. Because the point is to hone your submission yes. so that you only argue about the really important the critical issues, issues, the critical issues, the rest is... Well, you've got it, you've put it all in writing. Yes. My Lord, may I flag up, in addition to the matters I've set out in our skeleton argument, one or two matters, having reread the judgment, which indicate to, uh, to us on behalf of the mother that the judge, uh, at the time he delivered his judgment, clearly didn't have time or hadn't read the submissions, hadn't reminded himself of the evidence in detail. And there are two areas, um, or, or four areas, which I've, uh, two of which I've already flagged up. The first is, in two places in his judgment, he refers to speaking from memory. It's uh, paragraph 17 and paragraph 47 of his judgment. Uh, call bundle 166, which is electronic bundle 207. That's the main call bundle. I'm very sorry, I missed the paragraph numbers. Paragraph uh, 17 and 47 of the judgment. See why you remember that one. It's your submissions. Three, three lines down. Indeed, it's a point made by Miss Taylor from memory in her submissions. That was his memory, not yours. His memory, yes, not mine. And I was quite familiar with the detail of our was it, was it a point made in your submissions? <laughs> well, not like that. Okay. I mean, that could just be a. Well, it's, there, it's, uh, uh, it happens uh, uh, twice. Perhaps I'm being overcritical, but it's, it's the clear can, impression. Well, I can imagine why you feel sore about that if he's misheard what you said from memory. Yes. But um, it may just be a, 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 a tip, that's right. The way it, yes, we all have our perhaps, little, uh, little in which foibles, case, Ms. Taylor. I'll not press that point. But the, the other um, indication I submit that this judge, who is very um, a funcular, very pleasant yes. to yeah, appear yeah. in front of, etc., yeah, yeah. yeah. simply didn't have time to grasp the uh, complexities of the case and reread in, in I, I can only agree, in quite a painful way, many months after the hearing, to get back into the detail of the case is difficult. It, it, it is. It's very difficult. But he didn't have the opportunity to do that, and clearly didn't do it, because what he has done, and I flagged this up in, I think, in our uh, skeleton, uh, is that he adopts or adapts what is said on behalf of the children in that in their final uh, submissions. Missing out other areas which we've picked up. Uh, and I refer to this at paragraph 51 and 56 of our, our skeleton argument. So we 
understand that judges have a tr work under tremendous pressure, but uh, the imperative is for them to provide themselves enough time to properly prepare their judgments, to uh, provide structure to their judgments, as highlighted in the sensible advice and all of the authorities that have been quoted in our skeleton article. Was the other passage you were um, referring us to pa paragraph 47? Yeah. yeah. Yes. It's just the memory, but I'm, I'm, I'm not pressing that point. It's just an impression. But the other imperative, which uh, is, is perhaps case specific, is that our client doesn't speak English. Our client requires the assistance of an interpreter. I made a specific request to uh, His Honour Judge Oliver, I think it was at the, one of the hearings in the, at the beginning of the year when we were planning when the judgment would be, for him to provide a draft written judgment in advance that we would have an opportunity to take instructions on, or even, even conclusions of it, and for it to be interpreted to the client before it was handed down. Because there's always been pressure of time, as, as this court is aware with this case. The um, oldest child is going to be 17 very soon. There was always going to be a welfare hearing following quite soon after the uh, fact-finding judgment. But how does that help? Because a draft judgment isn't an opportunity to reopen submissions and to re-argue the case. It's for typographical errors. What, what were you inviting him to do? Or are you talking about a clarification process? No, I was, I was, instead of giving an oral judgment, which is in fact what Judge Oliver indicated he always does, yeah. I was asking him to provide what many judges do, is a, a written judgment. Ah, I that thought we you were saying a draft. No, well, sometimes it's uh, in draft form, as in uh, we can correct typographical, typographical errors, etc. But, 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 but we're really a, talking about whether it's a written judgment or an extemporary oral judgment. Yes. That's what you're really Yes. Talking. I apologise if I wasn't. No, no, I, I misunderstood. But that would, it's often the practice, and I've had this in other cases of this complexity, particularly when funds are limited, you don't always have an interpreter. You can have a day set aside for judgment to be handed down. You receive the judgment in the morning in written form. You have time with your client to go through it. For it to be interpreted outside court or explained, then you go in and, and uh, raise any issues with it, which is the more efficient way of, but for the client in particular, of understanding what has happened, what the judge has decided, and picking up on any uh, difficulties. Instead, uh, I, I wasn't present when this judgment was delivered. It took an hour and a half. It was delivered at pace. Interpretation was um, as adequate as it could be in the circumstances. But we are very confident that our client really didn't understand exactly what the judge was saying or why. So how long did it take to deliver? About an hour. An hour, an hour an and hour. a half. It's 2 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. An hour? I apologise. Yes, it's about 100 words a minute, according to my word count. 6,250 <laughs> words. Um, it's actually quite slow. Uh, speaking speeds go, but um, it's, it's more a question of what it didn't contain. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> um, I just, I'm reminded that the interpretation cannot be simultaneous. It has yes. to be done. I mean, are you, are you addressing the point the point that no clarification was sought is that why you're no no, no 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 I haven't I'm not I'm right. happy to address that issue right I, I'm, so I'm, to, uh, I'm just a little puzzled about what different I understand the difference between uh, a written judgment that has <coughs> been produced with the opportunity for reflection and reconsideration uh, as opposed to an oral judgment mm. uh, or, uh, as opposed to a judgment delivered in draft for you to, to think about and then come back into court. I mean, what what process are you envisaging at that stage? You can't re-argue the merits once the judge has produced a draft. I'm, I'm not asking to re-argue the merits. It's just uh, the question of the delivery of the judgment and the preparation of the judgment. So this was a reserve judgment. Mm 
Yes. And I don't uh, understand why this judge was not able to, uh, have it, to properly prepare a reserve judgment. Yes. Had he properly prepared a reserve yes. judgment, it could have been written. Yes. That, that well, yeah, I mean, actually, case. practice, I, um, diff different judges have yes. different practices. Mr. Justice Mitting, I think, almost always gave an oral judgment. Yes. But he, they were generally rather more detailed and longer yes. than this. Um, and they were carefully prepared. Yes. It's perfectly possible to, to prepare a careful judgment. It may be quicker uh, sometimes to do it that way. Some judges find it quicker to write everything down. Yes. Because when the judgment comes back for correction, it takes almost as long as it took to write in the first place. Yes. Um, there's, a, there's a whole range of different practices. If you went back 50 years, you probably find that handing down reserve judgments the way you're now prescribing them. It was the exception rather than the rule. Yes. Yes. Judges would tend to do what the law has said, which is have fairly full notes and deliver a judgment. It would be a reserved judgment, but would be delivered on the basis of extensive notes rather than simply reading out a fully transcribed, you know, fully a transcript of what mm. they were going to say. What I'm wondering is practice. whether, um, let's suppose, an impeccable um, oral judgment, as full as you possibly want, explaining everything. Uh, um, fully and dealing with it in an entirely satisfactory way and uh, um, the alternative of a full and impeccable written judgment is there an, in practice an advantage uh, of having the second as compared with the first? Absolutely. With the first? Yeah. Yes but it's not really a ground of appeal. No, no, no I'm it's not a, saying it's, that it, it is. It's, 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 it's from your clients, I can see yeah. from your client's point of view and from your point of view it would be better for the reasons you would Explained, but I don't think it's a ground of appeal. For my part, Ms. Taylor, if I can just lead, lead I may just lead you on. My, I'm more concerned with the, I'm, the, the, the practice of providing an overview judgment, which you can ask for more reasons for if you, if you want. Sorry, I'm rather putting it rather crudely, but that yes. seems to be what happened in this case. Yes. The judge said that he was intending to provide an overview, and if people and would always add more reasons. If people requested them. Now that is, is you're, 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 you're frowning at me, Mr. Taylor. Are I wrong? I, I don't mean to frown. Are, are I you think that's are you exactly you, what you happened. Are you because I got it wrong or because no, the, the, no. the idea pains you? <laughs> well, it pains me. Um, I've never come across it before. Well, that was my question. Is it becoming? Because I, as you would have gathered from, if I may, from other judgments, not just me, but others, we've, we've become increasingly concerned about the clarification process, the way it's being used. More and more requests. Of, you know, I've all this out, and it's in whichever case it's CDE, isn't it? We talk about and other cases. Is there a practice of providing an overview judgments, an overview of the decision, and then saying to the council, if you want more reasons, you can. I'm happy to provide them. No. Sorry, if, that, if that's too short and succinct a response, yes. but I've not come across it before because it's it's a flawed approach. It's intrinsically flawed because the purpose of the judgment is for the judge to explain all of the, um, the elements of the case, the evidence, the relevant law, analysis, etc. If, if we only go from uh, to the end, which is the judge's decision as an overview and a, a scanty summary of what the judge remembers, there can be no confidence that the judge has followed the uh, sufficiently rigorously the intellectual exercise of properly um, weighing up and considering all of the factors that he should consider, all of the evidence that he should bear in mind and draw together. If he has the uh, respect for the, or, or mentions the arguments put by the parties, I don't suggest that it, that they, everything needs to be set out in a judgment, it must be proportionate. But this was a case of, I can't remember, 12 days, 15 witnesses, and uh, the omissions the are so glaring that all the judge did is effectively what I can remember, actually. Magistrates used to do it. They used to just come in and give, give you their decision without explaining why. And then they were required to actually give reason. Yes. On a pro forma not, form. Not, that's not, not now. Not now. Not now. No, they used to do I'm that. I'm showing my right. age, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> but 
in the bad old days. Yes. But this is, I think, an article. It, it comes to procedural regularity as much as. Well, a danger, and I mentioned this, and I think it's in CDP, is that what you then get when the judge, you ask for further reasons is not things that were in the judge's mind but he didn't mention, but things that weren't in his mind mm -hmm. and, um, and had to be fitted in ex post facto yeah. to his conclusion. Yeah. Backwards reasoning. Backwards reasoning. That's the way of putting it. I was going right. to touch on jigsaw me metaphors, but I think they, well, we they abound in all yeah. of the... Um, <laughs> yes, the whole puzzle. From Dr. Peter Jackson said. Yeah. All right. Uh, the, is there anything else you want to say on grounds one and five? No. Well, again, uh, at the moment, I don't think we want to hear from you on the other grounds. But I would like to hear from you, please, on the question of what happens if we allow the appeal on grounds one and five. Uh, and um, I haven't got a clear set. We haven't got a clear sense of, of what the pro care plan proposals are. I know this is backwards reasoning, <laughs> arguably, but you're, what is... One of the things, it, it, uh, I think it's you that you, it's, one of you says, I think it's you who say that the, in deciding whether there should be a retrial, one should apply the criteria uh, um, in the Oxfordshire case as we iterated in other yes. cases. And so the question then arises well, to what extent is a retrial, would a retrial be necessary in the interest of the children or the future care plan? Yes, I, um, my understanding is that the very basic test is um, would any findings of fact actually inform yeah. uh, aspects of the uh, yes. care plan? And my, uh, I'm sure I'll be corrected if I'm wrong. You may have picked up that local authority appear to make concessions about the um, desirability or understanding. Well, they do, but the Guardian doesn't. Uh, well, but or didn't in written submissions. I don't know whether they can change that. But that's... What's the ambit of the issues? I, the ambit of the issues, as that. I understand them, is that this is a the position with with respect with respect to M and L. L is the child who yeah, yes. developed yeah. difficulties in the last six months and is in a um, uh, residential unit, secure. Secure. Not. She's sectioned. I apologise. <laughs> She's sectioned. I apologise. I haven't been involved directly no. in the welfare. And is sectioned. Section M is in a residential unit. Is L14? I'm so sorry. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Gosh. So L is sectioned. Yeah. M is. M is in a residential unit. Has a residential unit uh, place available. I understand she's back there now, but the history of the case at me in the last <coughs> since I've been involved in the last year has been that she comes home from time to time. I think at the time we wrote okay. our skeleton, she was living at home, and she goes back again. Okay. So the younger two children are still at home with. Yes. Um, I don't know what the final care plan is going to say. I think the parenting assessment has just been filed. Um, read out for M the parenting assessment says uh, we're not recommending M return to live in her parents care we're recommending contact with the family in overnight stays but they're her main base is semi-independent accommodation um, I don't know what's suggested for the other children I think that they remain I haven't seen this document before. <coughs> my understanding is the plan for the younger children, I apologise for turning my back. My, uh, my understanding of the plan is for the younger children to remain at home. So, uh, given the, um, I think, two important and, and I'll, Yes. Okay. So, so I suppose that there would then be an issue. Uh, it might uh, be an issue. Somebody might say they shouldn't remain at home. 
I don't think the argument might suggested. Be, someone might suggest, and there might be an argument about what order, if any, there should be. Yes. The um, younger children were briefly moved into foster care late last year uh, because of Elle's yes, allegations. Yes, that's right. But then they returned that's home, right. and they've been at home ever since. So they've been, in fact, I think they were under interim supervision orders throughout the proceedings, save for the time in, in care. Ms. Taylor, do you and Mr. Belchie <coughs> think it would be feasible for uh, there to be an agreement on how threshold is crossed? Absolutely. Has that always been your position? The, um, well, we haven't, to be fair, had discussions with the local authority about it because the focus has been M's allegations. But a wider threshold is, yeah, yes, because the uh, mother does accept certain issues. Um, but we've been, I think, sidetracked by these very, very significant allegations. Importantly, there has been high level of cooperation between the mother and the local authority, visit, um, visitors to the home, professionals. This is a case where there was social work intervention for years before proceedings started. Yes. The proceedings started because of these allegations in February 2021. But, uh, the court may recollect that the mother, in fact, herself asked for an assessment in December 2020 because of the CSE concerns, etc. So this is a family that does ask for help and accepts help and support. So um, I have to uh, submit that I don't see that it findings would make any difference to the care plans. Well, there have to be some findings. Uh, findings with respect to the uh, allegations. Right. Findings with the allegations, allegations would make no difference. There clearly needs to, the, the, uh, I have to concede that the threshold is met because of the high level of uh, dysfunction in the home at the time that proceedings were started. At least because of the arguments, the police being called, etc. Should be possible to agree a form of words without there being too much debate about it. I, we haven't started, but we are fairly collaborative on, okay. on the bar. All right. And importantly, the issue that the findings would uh, go to is the issue of the contact between the intervener and the siblings. And there's already been uh, careful thought about this, and you heard from the interveners council this morning, first thing, that he recognises that whether findings are made or not, uh, my client has the same position, the children need to pre be protected. Because whether findings, whether these allegations are true or not, the mental health issues for M and L are so acute, so difficult. L has autism. L um, is said to have lied about the allegations and then retracted them. She is the most confused, unhappy because it, it, is it just uh, around wise contact, or is it also around mother's attitude to safeguarding in the context of allegations that have not been determined either way? I would defer to the local authority perhaps on that point, but I haven't picked up that there were issues about safeguarding, well, save for the obviously the findings that were sought about the mother failing to protect. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's really yeah, what the, I'm talking yes, about. But the, Sorry, safeguarding that, may have been the wrong Yes, um, the, the, this court is reminded that the, all of the children remained at home. Mm. So there, there wasn't, was there, a wider safeguarding or failure to protect concern beyond how your client was said to have dealt with the allegations against why? Not that I'm aware of. I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, but I don't think it's been argued. Okay. Thank you. My Lord, unless I can assist further. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Ms. McMeekham. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> where, do I, where do I begin? <laughs> well, well, 
This, I, is, this I, is why we have all our advocates here. I've been saying, I've been teeing you up all morning now, Mr. Um, this is your opportunity. No, seriously. Obviously, I, I've, I've heard the points that uh, the, the court has engaged with uh, so far during this hearing. Um, the difficulty there is, is, is that the judge, when he gave his judgment, was very clear from the outset that he didn't give time, didn't have enough time to give a comprehensive um, tour of the evidence or tour of, of the written submissions, of which, of course, this court will have seen, they were extensive in, in their nature. Yeah. Um, and, of course, it is unfortunate that that was not able to be, have been achieved during the judgment, but the judge did invite uh, the parties, all parties, to um, seek clarification, amplification on areas in which he was unable to go through the detail in his overview. And in my submission, there are a, ve a variety of omissions. However, the key ingredients of the process that he was undertaking to reach the decisions he did are recorded in the judgment. But, um, of course, it does lead to further questions of clarification and amplification amplification in respect of the various points that have been made so far uh, this morning. So are you going to show us that he did deal with the key ingredients? Because presumably you would accept. We don't need to worry about recording the submissions. No judge needs to record the submissions. But what the judge does need to do, would you agree, is reflect his analysis of the conflicting evidence and his evaluation of its reliability. And, and, it, and that's the critical part of the judgment that it's said against you is missing. And the danger of going back to the judge afterwards is, as has been discussed, ex post facto rationalisation. My lady, yes. Insofar as the judgment is concerned, um, my submission is that he set out very basic parties' positions in respect of their um, submissions and their cases. And it is right to say that the full case on behalf of uh, Y was not explicitly um, incorporated into the judgment, albeit there are elements of the judgment which refer in passing to his overall case. What the judge does do in my submission is he goes through the allegations and um, quite rightly has regard to the withdrawals and the allegations and that process. And the evidence that he relies upon as set out in his judgment is the, the fact of the consistency of M's core allegations leads him in his decision making process and, and his analysis of the evidence to conclude that the allegations that she has made are more, more likely to be true than not. And by doing that, he in essence um, implicitly rejects Y's case, which is why it, it is not included in detail in, in his judgment. And of course, that omission can be addressed through um, amplification. Without any danger of The judge had the benefit of judicial continuity. He heard all of the evidence. He was he case managed it, ha case managed the proceedings throughout. He also had the benefit of, as I've already alluded to, extensive written submissions. Yes. And it, in my submission, if he was able to refresh his memory on uh, what was contained within those writ written submissions, he wouldn't have. Uh, there'll be less likely of the danger of him going through that. Ex post facto rationalisation. 
What slightly is concerns me is that the um, uh, clarification expansion, or whatever you call it, was an option available to the parties, not something that the judge regarded as part of his function if the parties didn't specifically ask for it. And that leaves open the possibility, if the judgment was deficient in some way, that the parties might take some time to make a decision, well, actually, we do want to know why you decided this, or why you didn't accept this submission or that piece of evidence six months later. And, and in that case, there's a great reason <laughs> But having taken quite a long time to get to the point of actually making a decision, the judges are just not going to be able to give a candid or good faith explanation of why he reached the decision, because he just won't know. It'll be too late. Lord, the circumstances that arose when he when the judge gave his judgment were not ideal. I, I would have to concede that. Yeah. Everybody would have benefited from a draft written judgment, but that simply wasn't afforded, time was not afforded it in, in this particular situation, nor indeed was time afforded to the judge on the day that he gave judgment. He had a very heavy list that day, I think about five cases, and we were towards the end of the day. The judge also had a period of leave booked from the day after the judgment was given uh, for a period of about three weeks, and he in fact listed the next hearing in this matter on the very first day of his return from leave. So we were left with circumstances where he didn't have sufficient time to give a detailed oral judgment, um, which is why it would seem he gave an overview. It included, in my submission, the key ingredients of his decision-making process and the decisions, the outcome of the decisions, and invited the parties at various points to make um, submissions or seek further clarification, uh, amplification, during that period when he was on leave. He was never going to be in a position to do that until he returned from leave on the 17th of April. So it, it was open to the parties in the court to set a very strict timetable to enable um, sufficient and but focused time on, on amplification and clarification queries to be, to be addressed. So it wouldn't have been the case where there would have been months and months ago um, passing by uh, with that danger of, of memory and um, engagement in the case slipping away. Would you accept that there comes a point where the omissions are so extensive and so serious that, that the case simply can't be rescued by clarification? I'm sure you say that's not this case, but, but, but just in general. Of course, in general, uh, there must be case um, judgments where omissions are so glaring that it, it cannot be recoverable. But in this judgment, albeit he has been concise and, and given brief overviews of not only the law but the evidence, he has concentrated on the key evidence that was given throughout, throughout the proceedings and the key parts of each party's case sufficient enough for... Uh, anybody reading the judgment to understand um, what was being alleged, the process by which he reached his decision, and the outcome of that decision. <coughs> your, your point is, as you say in paragraph 14 of your helpful skeleton, that his judgment is, decision is not so devoid of analysis as to invalidate the opportunity to provide additional clarification or expansion. Well, that, I would say so, is a way of putting your case. <laughs> I suppose that, that is in a nutshell. I, I can't defend uh, the, the judgment in terms of the detail that was required. Um, obviously, from the local authority's perspective, we would have welcomed more detail. But we can see how he reached that process. And we can see that he did not just rely on a sum an agreed summary of the law. He did apply the law... He, he set out his own uh, references to the legal principles. He has reminded himself of, of the very dangers of the fact that M did not give evidence throughout uh, the proceedings. And he did remind himself in the judgment of, of the pitfalls that he could potentially fall into had he not considered each of those um, principles and requirements. 
Can you remind me? I, someone asked for some further information. I think it was the first appellant, not, but not the local authority. No. The reason being is that immediately after the judgment was given, and bearing in mind this was at the very end of the day, with the judge going on leave the very next day, um, the intervener's team immediately emailed after the hearing, whilst we were all at court, and I think the emails were in the bundle. Um, the local authority did not see the need at that point to seek clarification because the intervener had already sought clarification. We had anticipated that the mother's team would also be in the same position at the hearing on the 17th of April, once they had had a chance to digest the judgment, because both the, t the trial team who are here today were not present at the judgment mm -hmm. hearing. Yeah. So we fully expected to go to the April hearing with both appellants uh, being in a position to seek a list of areas that they sought clarification. So was your position neutral? You, you, you expected that to be raised? Essentially, yes. We, we, you weren't we, opposing it? No, we were not, we were not opposing. Or saying it was unnecessary? No. But we, we were not leading that because we, we were expecting it to be done. We thought that there would be a <coughs> time process, as I um, alluded to earlier, a focused time process upon which that um, exercise could be achieved as soon as the judge came back from leave. Yeah. So you but saw the point? saw the point because, of course, the judge was very clear he was giving an overview and we anticipated that there'd be areas of clarification sought. In fact, he was inviting the same. Um, and we, we could not necessarily disagree that there wasn't the detail that perhaps would be required. Um, but at the same time, we expected there to be a, a further expansion on his reasons, given the time pressures he was under on that day. But of course, when we arrived at the hearing on the 17th of April, um, the mother's team decided understandably the took the plump, a different position the field, yeah. and uh, Wise team followed yeah, suit. Followed on, yeah. And at that point, of course, because we knew that permission, well, both, both parties sought permission at that hearing, <laughs> at that point, um, we came seeking to a, clarification. We came to a view as yes. to what was <laughs> yes. likely to happen. So um, right. hopefully we were not okay. criticised for no, that. No, no. No, I, was just well, trying, I, was, I wasn't trying to. I, mean, no, I think you were in a very different I was just trying to explore what the, how, how it all developed. And I think, I think this, was, <coughs> this is an enormously difficult case for the local authority to handle. I mean, not just you, but social workers. I mean, you know, we've, we've been conducting this hearing in a very um, straightforward way, but there are some very grave concerns about this. Now, um, is there anything else you want to say on grounds one and ground five? Un unless your lordship and ladyship um, have any particular questions I can answer. I, I don't think we do, but we would like to know, please, what do you think should happen if we are minded to grant the appeal on one and five? As I've alluded to in my, at the conclusion of my skeleton, we can see, of course, the strong argument against there being the necessity of a rehearing. Uh, of course, the social workers on the ground are dealing with the family on the ground, and in yeah. particular, the, the young people involved. On the other hand, we are concerned that um, if these allegations are not resolved in one way or another, or, or safely managed, even if they're not determined, that leaves the family and the children at risk. I'm pleased to hear the position being taken today at this hearing on behalf of Y, insofar as um, contact with his siblings is concerned, and I understand that from uh, my learned friend's submissions that the mother is following suit. I haven't had a chance to obviously take instructions on that point, but that's the sort of safeguarding that the local authority would be more reassured about, because of course the danger is if, if no findings are made or determined either way in respect of M's allegations, then it leaves open the question for the family, or, or in particular the parents, that because findings haven't been made, these things didn't happen. And that's a real concern for us as a local authority. So what are, what is the, con is the concern just the risk of why, or what, can you just tell, explain the what the concern, concern is? The concern is the risk of why. Yes. Um, 
but also the risk insofar as the mother and father, uh, with more emphasis on the mother because she's the primary carer, concerns about her ability to recognise or safeguard against something that she doesn't believe to be true. And that was her, her stance throughout the fact-finding hearing, albeit her written evidence was more neutral. When it actually came down to her giving evidence, it was very, very clear that she was unable um, to even contemplate uh, the possibility of, of this um, significant risk to the younger children. The local authority to care plan as it stands is for the younger two children to remain at home with monitoring. Under a supervision order? Under a supervision order for 12 months. Um, we have recently um, completed a parenting assessment and also there's been a psychological assessment of the mother. And both of those assessments have not been able to fully explore the risk uh, of mother's ability to safeguard because she's perhaps understandably with this appeal um, pending she has not been able to engage in an either or situation um, and, and simply remains of that stance that she cannot contemplate the possibility of such a risk and of course that carries on in, in so far as how to safeguard these children in the future we do appreciate of course that any rehearing would have a significant emotional impact on the family as a whole. Um, so we are really mindful of that because we don't want to make the situation worse. But if, if the, the allegations can be ring-fenced and safeguarded in a, in a different way, uh, then we would be certainly welcoming of, of that scenario. Yeah. But it's not, it doesn't sound, I mean, we haven't looked at other aspects of these the younger, younger children's circumstances. It doesn't sound as though the local authority would be minded to remove the younger children. Not currently, no, because as my learned friend explained, at the end of last year, that was... Uh, well, when the new allegations and it, about... And actually, L yes, and actually we recognise that it was uh, more harmful the younger children at that particular period of time to be separated from their family than uh, remaining within the family and safeguarded as best um, as can be managed in the situation. And there's nothing uh, in the recent assessment which su suggests that they should be removed um, no. as long as the overall risk can be managed. Yes. There are concerns... I mean, this does feel like something. Which could be, which ought to be resolvable at an issues resolution hearing conducted by an experienced judge at the Central Family Court. Potentially. So one course for this would be to, if if we allow the appeal, having had all the submissions yet, but if we allow the appeal, to remit the matter to Judge Roberts or Judge Satnara. Um, for, for this to be thrashed out. I don't think, I, we're not really in a position, we wouldn't have been in a position to resolve the case here today. It needs a lot of, we need a lot of uh, yes. careful thought and um, not just lawyer thought, it needs thought by the social workers who will have to manage this case after you've gone. Yes. I mean, at, at the moment there is the added complication that M is no longer in a placement up north she was referred back to a placement in London that has returned home, and that's okay. another area that we're having to manage on. She's the not ground. deprived of her liberty, is she? No. Um, and it would be possible, wouldn't it, to conclude the proceedings with regard to M first, yes. under beyond parental control threshold. Um, so we wouldn't. The proceedings with regard to the younger children don't have to be completed for M's birthday, but her proceedings do. Yes, that, that's certainly the, the local authority's preference mm. to ensure that M's proceedings are concluded sooner rather than later, because it's clearly having an impact on her um, mental health 
and, and the families. Well, actually, yeah, but, all but the it's, it's, She's more urgent, yes, of yes, course, because she's absolutely. 17 in September. Thank you very much, Mr. Gideon. Very well put, if I may say so. Yes. My now, lords, my lady, you have my. Yes, this, this, uh, this, you're, this is your keen on behalf of the, of the father. Yes, and uh, my lord, it's noted what you uh, outlined earlier in relation to these ministry. Um, the father hasn't attended. We were yeah. expecting him to, and uh, your lordships and your lordship will have noted that he's a protected party. Yes. Um, he has struggled throughout these proceedings. Yes as have the whole family. It's been very, very distressing. Well, his circumstances are obviously an important feature within the family life. Yes, and um, he, he has witnessed um, all of the difficulties. He sat for most of the evidence in the yeah. fact-finding hearing, and his clearly expressed views are in support of yeah. the Of course, intelligence. these proceedings are on live stream and they are recorded. Um, so one factor about intermediaries with these proceedings is that they can be watched again. Yes, and, and that certainly will happen with the um, assistance of an interpreter right. so that he can understand. But um, your Lordships and your Ladyship may have noted that his that the plank of the father's position is heavily in support yes. of the fact that this family experienced gangs, um, involvement of, of gangs and drugs and that, that's very heavily his focus yes. uh, and of course as you've heard on behalf of the appellants um, adequacy of reasoning in relation to the evidence heard um, does not make its way into the no. um, I don't propose to trouble thank you very much thank you now Miss Kang welcome to the case I think were you involved at any point before I was my lord I was um, instructed in earlier hearings um, for the aborted fact-finding hearings to go have some knowledge <coughs> of this case and this family. And firstly, just want to say that all parties put a lot of work to ensure this matter was trial-ready um, for this fact-finding um, hearing. Um, I cannot take credit for the skeleton argument that's been uh, placed before court and uh, Miss Croft has spent a lot of time yes. uh, preparing detailed written... I'm sorry if the urgent listing has meant that she's not able to attend, but we're very grateful to you for being here. Thank you. Um, and just really, all parties knew how important it was for this fact-finding to go ahead, and everyone put in the effort to try to hold it up. And... Um, the judge was assisted by detailed written submissions, uh, agreed note of law, and an extremely detailed chronology to assist him when determining this matter. Um, I cannot um, deny that there are um, deficiencies in this judgment and that there are um, significant omissions. Um, and that the ABE of Miriam in particular um, apologies have not been um, analysed in um, no. from what I can see in, in, in the judgment provided. Um, what we do say is that we do fall behind on the local authority on the point of perhaps the judge should be given another opportunity to set out um, clarification in relation to this judgment, but I can see why the court may not be with me on that. Well, it's nearly a year since the hearing. Yes. And really, the, the Guardian took that position because she's concerned about the delay. Absolutely. Well, I can imagine the Guardian's anxiety about... Um the delay in this case, and, the, and the, 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 this is a, she's got the responsibility of representing these these young people, and she must be aghast at the what's happened to them during the proceedings. It's all not a great, all not these a great young people, this family, reflection on the way the system works. All these, this family, 
the entire family and the children needed a decision. Yes, and do. Still and do. still do. Uh, well, I don't really, unless I can assist her. The no, you, you're basically you say this is a, you, you say this that there was enough, just enough in this judgment. <laughs> no, enough in this judgment to, to bring it within the framework of clarification. That's your point. You've made that point. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Or if Miss Croft has a new support. Now, on the question of what happens if we're against you, do you have a view or position? Just, you were quite clear, that, or Miss Croft was quite clear, there should be a rehearing. Yes, and the Guardian has um, thought about the way forward. She has been struggling with how this matter should be dealt with following um, the day should the appeal succeed. The dynamics between this, the parents, the family, the family dynamic in general is a concern. Um, and she would ideally wish to avoid having a rehearing if that is possible and there is a way through it. Um, the difficulties that she had um, was that we were not clear, firstly, whether the threshold was being accepted as met. So that well, I mean, it depends um, how it's put, doesn't it? I mean, I'll, I think the mother. Um, Miss Taylor seems pretty confident, that, very confident, that, that she could put forward a form of words, or she and Miss Bagchuk could put forward a form of words which they would consider and the court would accept, could it could accept, would cross the threshold. The question, I suppose, is whether the other parties accept that it's a sufficient yes. crossing of the threshold. And also, the allegations, of course, are relevant to any risk assessment as already indicated in relation to why, but also mum, um, that um, and her ability to safeguard. Now, I... Um, the position seems quite... Forgive me for interrupting you again. The position seems to be pretty clear that uh, mother doesn't accept the truth of the allegations, and that's mother's position. Yes. So a risk assessment has to be on that basis. Yes, and... Really, with um, having read the submissions on behalf uh, by all parties, my understanding was that Y would like to return home, or certainly Mum would like him to return home. And so, Herman, I thought he was in now in independent accommodation, and there was no suggestion um, yeah. of returning home. Miss Wester was pretty clear about that. Yeah. I it, I take that from the written submissions that are at um, on behalf of. Um, why? At the hearing, or for us? At the fact-finding hearing. Mm. Well, that's some time ago. Yes, some I understand ago. the position's moved on. That's yeah. not something that... But these are all, I mean, they're leaving threshold to one side. Yes. This sounds as though it would be the sort of case where a way forward could be agreed in terms of where the children, where the young people are. Yes. Why, why in semi in, in independent organisation, having some form of supervised contact only with the family? M in um, semi independent living, no, well, in residential units at the moment, but away from the family but having contact. L at the moment in secure section, rather, but again, managed managed communication with the family and the younger children at home. So the framework looks, it doesn't look as though there's any disagreement about that. The, the Guardian has has had those exact thoughts and, and would accept that way forward and would hope that um, in relation to safeguarding the um, children, I, and I understand that uh, we would have to proceed on the basis that the allegations are not true, but to say not determined either not, way. Or not, apologies, not determined either way, and that um, we would ask that they, well, we'd ask why, whether he would agree to some form of undertaking. Yes. Well, again, this is. I don't think we can really. I don't criticise you for raising this, Ms. Cairn. You're right to indicate it, 
but I don't. We can't. I don't think we're going to be able to resolve this. I don't think whether this is the right forum to resolve. Not least because, of course, we haven't got the, the yeah. full participation yeah. of the of the parties. And you could say, well, that's my fault for not agreeing with intermediaries. But um, I think it feels like something which should be dealt with by a judge at first instance at First Avenue House. But anyway, so well, the Guardian's position is, she's had a rethink. Yes. She sees the arguments against a rehearing. Yes. She's very concerned. About Thinks it should be resolved as quickly as possible. Absolutely. And would hope that a framework, both in terms of threshold and plan, can be agreed. Yes. I would just like to also flag that um, M had been informed of the outcome of the fact finding hearing. Right. And so she will need an explanation as to what has happened. Um, and I just. I raise that given her own mental health and um, having to deal with these things, well, this particular issue very carefully. Yes, all right. That's a good point. Because the guardian's responsibility, I expect. Yes, it is. It's, it's something that's going to have, again, it's going to have to be. Um, thought about, and again, I, I, I raise it simply just... I haven't really focused on it. This has been an extraordinary difficult case for the Guardian. Is the Guardian behind you? The Guardian is not behind you. Okay, oh, forgive yeah. me. Well, the Guardian, maybe watching, this, I would like to acknowledge the enormous difficulties this, this case must have had for the Guardian, as well as the social workers. Yes. Very, very worrying case. Mm. We're very grateful to them all that they've done. Thank you. My Lord, unless I can assist. Okay. Thank you very much. I don't expect you want to say anything, but uh, on, on grounds, what, anything else in reply? Or uh, did you have a chance to? My, my lord, no. I, I, unless there's something that the court wanted me to come back on. Not on we're still focusing on ground one and ground five. Anything you wanted to say, Ms. Taylor? Lord, no. Well, what we're going to do now is just go rise for a few minutes and have it, see where we are, and then come back and um, tell you what we want to do next. My Lord, might I respond just though briefly to something the oh, yes. Guardian said about the disposal? Yes, I'm oh, sorry, I should have... I, I, I've steered you away, forgive me. Yes. Not at all. Um, uh, things have changed very much for Hawaii. Yes. Um, one of the issues uh, outlined in the evidence before the judge below was that to an extent, and I think there's no dispute here, Y had been parentified and was being heavily leaned on by his parents. And he's been able to make that break. He's no longer part of the carer mm. picture. Well, I, we have, I imagine he had a role, given his father's circumstances, he must have had a, a, a different role from other older siblings. Absolutely. And that was, I, th I think it's fair to say that mother did lean on, on why, even after he'd left the property. Yeah. And that's no longer the case. No. And so that, that interaction isn't, isn't, isn't no. necessary. It's no longer part of the general picture of no, the family. No, needs thought. Might need some work. Though. No doubt he visits. A, a, he doesn't visit. Oh, he doesn't even no. visit. No. no, and this is all done by oh. agreement. There's no order keeping him away. We say that he has complied with that, with those requirements. I, I understand that Laura made an allegation that he was on the property, but he was able to show that he wasn't there, and indeed that allegation was abandoned. So it's. Um, it, it's a very, very different picture for why. So is there no relationship between him and his mother? Yes, they, they, they stay outside. in contact. But he's not at the home? No. I see. Um, and, and he's not seeing his younger siblings either? Though. No, not. I mean, he speaks to them on the phone. But um, Well, all this needs... Yeah, well, this, this is something which will, again, need further work from somebody, I would have thought. I, 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 I accept, but it does militate against a further hearing and an in, on the necessity of a further, uh, sorry, of a further back yeah, yeah, right. and and towards the idea of a negotiated agreement. Yes. That's all I had to say. Thank you very much. All right, well, we're going to rise for a few minutes. So please wait. Thank you very much.
go and loiter by the door? We won't go far, because they're not going to be long, are they? Okay.
Well, we're going to allow the appeals on grounds one and five. We're going, in those circumstances, we don't think it necessary to consider grounds two, three, and four. We're going to remit the case to a judge at the Central Family Court, and I shall liaise with the designated family judge to see if she can take it, to be listed for an urgent issues resolution hearing um, as soon as possible. Uh, my propo our proposal is to give reasons at quarter to three in what will be an extempore judgment. <laughs> we look forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's our present. I mean, if it's not yes, possible... Yes. Yeah, I'll say more about exactly what the steer will be in the judgment about how to proceed. There will be something in the judgment, but rather than say anything about it now, you have to wait a quarter to three to hear what I, we have to say about that. Um, my Lord, could I just flag up one thing um, yes. that the probably needs to know? Intervener was discharged by the order of 21st of March. So if his, his involvement was contemplated in this next hearing, he would need to be reinstated as intervener in order to be funded. I think he does have to be reinstated. Whether he has to play any active part will be a matter for the judge at the next hearing. I'm grateful. Could you perhaps, now we've given you an indication of where we're going with this, could you perhaps think about the terms of an order? My Lord, and yes. if, if your juniors could produce a draft, that would be really helpful. That tops. Um, Pleased to hear it. Thank you all very much. Yeah.